Hi, my name is Reggie Williams. Hi, my name is Londe Youssef. And we are the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In our next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Paul Garns, a line producer who has worked on Queen Sugar and Selma. We talked to Paul about how he broke through the industry and his career as a line producer. All right, Paul, thank you for uh, joining us for the Black Film Space podcast. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to to start off by asking how you broke into the film industry as a line producer, like how you went from producing your for- first short to where you're at now on Queen Sugar. Sure. Like many people, um, decided that I wanted to go into the film business um, when I was going to college. So I decided to go to film school, Columbia College in Chicago. Because of my age, it was kind of like the renaissance of black directors, um, you know, from anywhere, uh, people discussing Spike Lee to, I don't even know if you remember him, but Maddie Rich, who did a fe- feature film on a credit card. Um, oh, wow. It was like a renaissance for like indie filmmaking. And in my mind, I was like, I want to be a director. Yeah. Uh, went to film school and quickly realized um, during that process that producing was the thing that I liked. Um, and, you know, it turned into a, from me directing to, you know, everyone who was directing asking me, hey, where can I get short ends for, you know, my feature? Or, hey, where can I get a 10 ton truck? Cause I need, uh, you know, to move some set deck around. And I just turned into that guy um, at school who tried to figure it out and make productions happen. Uh, and midway through my college career, I decided that. Um, directing wasn't actually the thing for me. It was producing. Mm-hmm. What What didn't you like about directing? I, I loved it. It's just that it didn't it, it didn't fulfill me the same way as producing did. Like I, you know, I thought directing was great, um, but you know the 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 feel of accomplishing or thinking through the problems of a production, you know, from the money or the manpower, um, it was something that I couldn't duplicate in any other position. Um, and it was something I naturally fell into. So I pursued it. I just kind of chased that down. Got it. Got it. And, and how did you progress, um, to the point where you're line producing on major television shows? Sure. Um, you know, I started off, I moved to LA from Chicago after graduating, um, and started off as a PA, I guess like most people do, um, but quickly moved into production coordinating production supervising. Um, I even did some accounting for production. uh, And that, you know, all kind of led to um, me being kind of a go-to person for low-budget indie films. And you know how it is when you start off, um, you start off with a whole group of kind of starving artists. Everybody's in the same position. The directors are directors who studios may not want to hire or the writers or writers the studios may not want to hire the actors or actors the studios may not want to hire so you know we would get together and you know we would do our own little independent film or short and um um those same people you know much as me stayed in the business and now all of a sudden you know those actors are now actors that are sought after those directors and writers are directors and writers that are working professionally um so it's kind of like a a a a class of, you know, coming in as freshmen and, you know, kind of being underemployed. And then, you know, at some point, hopefully you get to be like a upperclassman where, you know, it's a, a more of a traditional mainstream experience. The first short that uh, you were a line producer on was Shock Asylum. Yeah, it was a teacher, um, a teacher at, at Columbia, uh, who's a writer and his brother was a comedic actor for Second City. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the writer, producer, who was also an instructor, his name was Dan Danello. Uh, his brother um, is Paul Danello. Uh, and we ended up doing this like kind of dark comedy um, uh, starring Paul. 
and uh, and his some of his lesser known um, Second City alum like Stephen Colbert who was in it, um, and uh, and you know we just made this kind of quirky dark comedy film. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was the first thing I did. I was j- just graduated from college, uh, and Dan had reached out to me about um, joining uh and producing the film with them and uh it was a great experience it was like i the first thing that i take credit independently to say that i produce awesome it's amazing that you can remember the premise and everything for that film being that was like 21 years ago um yeah, it was long ago. so what what's the difference between producing um like a low budget short film and uh a studio film you know, it's funny. There are, there are good and bad parts to it, right? I mean, obviously the, the, the bad parts are that it's, you know, it's very low key. You don't really get a lot of praise for it. Nobody gives you a lot of respect for doing kind of low budget indie films. Um, it, it's, you know, I think equally as hard work as doing a bigger, bigger budget movie. Um, but you just don't get all those same resources and the talent pool may be a little different. And, your pitch as a producer to sell it to people is a little bit different um, because, you know, there's no promise of any real rewards out of it outside of ambition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the, the positive side of it is the freedom you get doing it. Um, you know, one of the challenges uh, working, you know, on a studio driven or, you know, big production company production uh, is the politics and the process. And um, it's a lot more oversight on, how and why and when you should do things. Um, so some of my best experiences, I think, were the indie films where, yeah, we weren't 100% sure that, um, you know, we had a solid plan, maybe we were doing it, or, you know, one of the crew members was making enchiladas for catering because we couldn't afford a caterer. Um, but, um, you know, just kind of the wild, wild west of trying to figure it out, and making it happen, and um, that was just so rewarding. Um, you know, with the bigger features or TV shows, you get the security of, you know, the hundred year process of how we make movies and TV shows. Yeah. Um, you get the same stress of it, but I feel like you don't get as much freedom. And, you know, sometimes the, the, the reward of pulling it off doesn't feel as sweet. Got it. Got it. And what about, um, like the first short that you worked on or some of the first projects, like what, what lessons did you learn? that some of our uh, listeners might find useful? Um, you know, on, you know, Shock Asylum, which was that short, it was, um, and it, it was, you know, the crew basically worked for free, uh, worked for food, as we would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and half of my job as a producer was making sure that I could get great food for the crew. Um, you know, and, and it was, you know, so I learned a lot there, just that, you know, even if you're paying them or not paying them, good food makes morale great. Yeah. Um, and, and people will, you know, go above and beyond, um, if they're eating well, no matter mm-hmm. what they're getting paid. Mm-hmm. And you could be paying someone $250 an hour. If you're feeding them badly, you're going to hear about it. It doesn't matter yeah. how much you're paying. Um, you know, from there, I did a, a few years later, did a, uh, indie film that got picked up by HBO, um, called Dancing in September. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and that was, you know, probably that was the first feature that I had done, um, you know, where I did the budget and, you know, hired the crew and had to deal with the union issues and insurance. And, you know, like it it was a real learning experience to pull off a production. Um, And it was, you know, something that I was, um, I felt very prepared for, but it was still a, a reach for me. So it was definitely something where I learned how to be in charge of people and how to be a leader and, and, you know, not necessarily, um, always having, um, you know, even if I wasn't a hundred percent sure that it was going to work out the way I wanted it to work out, I had to damn well make sure that everybody else believed it. Yeah. Um, and you know, so it was like, it was real tested leadership and a, you know, first time kind of moving forward on a million dollar feature, which, um, you know, sounds like a, a lot of money and the movies for less, but it doesn't really matter. It still was tough. And, um, you know, we had, you know, some real actors in it for the first time and, you know, having to explain to some actor who's worked in the business for a while while they were sharing a, a five room trailer, um, you know, or we had 
we had a caterer, this guy named Hitch, that, you know, had some questionable food practices that, you know, you had to, like, try to convince everybody, like I said about food earlier, that, hey, food's going to get better, guys. Don't worry. We're going to make a change. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, but it was like that that show really, you know, taught me a lot about leadership. Um, but then I did this uh, little movie um, called Players Ball. It was like a basketball, uh, a basketball player had funded the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and I learned some hard lessons on that one of, you know, making sure that I could make payroll. It was an indie film, had investors. We did cash flows for it. They didn't always hit their cash flow. Um, and again, just, you know, being in charge and, and being responsible for not only making the film, but, you know, the crew kind of looks to that producer to be responsible for taking care of them and making sure that no matter what, you know, we always had the money to be able to pay the people for what they did and never find myself in a position because that particular film, I, you know, got to a point where I started to feel like, oh man, am I going to get myself in a a predicament? Like, are we going to be able to make payroll this week? Mm -hmm. Um, And it definitely helped me draw new rules and doing indie films about how to handle uh, cash flow with investors and making sure that, you know, I can make my payroll. What do you mean by um, making your payroll? So, so usually with investors, they don't just give you all the money for the production up front. There's mm-hmm. usually like a schedule on this date, we'll give you X amount of dollars, you know? So let's just say it's a million dollars. Let's say every Friday, they're going to give you a hundred thousand um, dollars, you know, and then you have to build a plan around being, making sure that you can, pay all your crew, pay all your equipment based on when they're going to deliver you money. Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes you could find yourself in a predicament if they're like a couple of days late on, you know, doing the, the, the deposit, um, you know, but payroll comes around on Thursday. Um, the crew looking for their, for their money. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't want to write checks that you know aren't going to clear because that's just going to, you know, put you in a really bad position. So then it just comes down to, you know, you know, for me, you know, just try to be as honest as you can about where you are within the situation. You know, I've always tried to make sure that we had the money, but, you know, there's been productions where you have to, you know, you know, dip into your pocket to try to pay it, do whatever you had to do to try to, to keep the morale up and, you know, not develop any kind of reputation. Because, again, as a producer, you don't want to be the person who didn't pay the crew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course. What What is the difference between... Um, a line producer, production man, unit production manager, production coordinator. Um, sure. What are the difference in, the, in those roles? So the most misunderstood title in the film business is producer, right? There's a yeah. hundred different terms for it. And each term probably has three different names. Um, and they even mean something different between television and film. Um, but ultimately what you have are two different kind of producers. You have a creative producer and then you have a physical producer. Um, the creative producer is basically the person who deals with things like this would be a great idea to turn this script into a TV show or a movie or you know what, I know this actor inspires me to say I want to find a project for them um, or I have a great project that I can I know I can match actor, writer, and director to. Mm-hmm. Like all those creative elements that that uh, push a production into fruition. Um, the physical producer is the person who comes in after that. And once you say, okay, I have an idea for an, a project, I have a writer, and I have actors and a director, now what do we do next? And then the physical producer comes in and comes up with a schedule and a budget and, you know, starts working through some of the um, more specifics of how do we pull that off? If you're going to make the movie The Titanic, you know, how do we show the ship sinking? Do we do we build a ship? Do we do it as a model? Do we invent new technology and do it in computer graphics? How much is that going to cost? How real will that look? And you start developing that process of execution um, to be able to make, you know, the production viable. Uh, and it's the melding of those two disciplines, the creative producing and physical producing, um, that makes it happen now. Uh, in the physical producing, there's a couple of different titles that are in that space. Line producer is probably the holy grail one, though sometimes people go by, produced by, um, also in the same sense. Um, and sometimes you can find a someone who has like a supervising producer, though in TV that usually is a writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, 
you know, as a line producer, the, the, it ups the ante a little bit because now you're also operating as kind of the in between, the go between between the studio, uh, the finance company and the creative. And you kind of sit right in the middle of them all, uh, and try to, manage that process, the creative process with the logistics process, with whatever the studio has, it's, it's, you know, given process. And, you know, hopefully if you can make all those parties comfortable and everybody trusts each other, you can get through a production, you know, on budget, on schedule, and ideally, you know, have a, 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 a product that everyone thought they were going to have or better. Mm-hmm. And, and what about the uh, the unit production manager and production? So unit production manager is it's really kind of turned into a union designation for um, part of what line producer does. And, and you can have a UPM, a unit production manager and a line producer, or I often act as both from mm-hmm. the unit production manager and line producer. The unit production manager is the DGA, the kind of designated um, adult on set uh, responsible for you know, uh, signing off on call sheets, hiring the crew, firing the crew, um, judging if things are safe, um, um, keeping the the ship, you know, going in the right direction for, um, you know, the sake of the production, Um, you know, like staying on schedule, staying on budget. Um, Typically, if you get a little bit more responsibility into it, um, they'll, you know, go up to a line producer um, so that you have the uh, authority to make certain decisions uh, above just being a unit production manager. Okay, cool. Um, what kind of directors do line producers and uh, executive producers like to work for? Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a mixed bag. Um, that relationship is either the best friend relationship or the most hated enemies relationship, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because if you're not on the same page, line producer and director uh, can battle back and forth about, um, you know, how to pull something off and what you need to pull it off. Um, but if you can, you know, build a, the right relationship and you trust each other, uh, it can be an amazing relationship. So for me, I really like um, directors that, you know, are really passionate about directing that have um, a really clear understanding of what it is that they want to do. Um, you know, sometimes, and it happens quite a bit of production uh, where, you know, the money doesn't go as far as our ambition wants mm-hmm. it to go. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for me, if I can go to a director and say, Hey, here's the situation we're having, you know, you're asking for a crane for, you know, six days, we can only afford a crane for three days. Um, let's talk through, this is my approach, let's talk through where you needed to crane and maybe we can come up with another creative way to pull that off on those other days. Yeah. Um, directors that, you know, for me at least, that are really driven by the creative will say, cool, let me approach it from, a, you know, a creative standpoint of, of a, a challenge or an opportunity to come up with something else cool we can do to pull off that same feeling. What I don't like is obviously a director who's like, you know, no, I want what I want. And if I can't have it, then I'm going to make a, a I'm going to, you know, be upset about it. Or equally, I don't really want somebody who says, fine, I can't have it. I just won't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, because then, you know, it, it, the show suffers. Um, so, you know, it's always nice to have, a, you know, someone to partner with who understands kind of what the job of the line producer is, which is to see the big picture. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, that said, you know, a lot of directors have been burned by, you know, shysty um, producers who just kind of, you know, go at them and try to cut, cut, cut without really any meaning behind it. Um, you know, so, you know, it can go either way. I just always, I prefer to have directors, like I said, that kind of in that sweet spot of really driven creatively, but has a balanced understanding of kind of what all of our jobs are, and you know, and we'll try to work within that to still make great content, even though there have to be some limits in time. Okay. And um, are, are there any differences or what are the differences between being a line producer for a, a feature film and for episodic content? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, so the, the, on the feature side, um, it's a different process because you have a lot more prep, like you spend a, a big chunk of your time 
pre- preparing for the for the show in its entirety. Um, where TV, we spend it's kind of two preps, right? You prep for the season, which is like you know, let's figure out what our sets are that we want to use all season, and let's figure out what our locations are that we want to use all season, uh, and then we still have to prep for each episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it can feel a lot more. The pace is just more intense in TV in that sense. Um, you know, I've worked on a lot of shows that don't fit normal formulas very well, where it's mm-hmm. just kind of like a, a you know police procedural where you're in the squad station for two days, you're on location for two days, you're you know um, in the police car for two days. Like we don't the shows I've worked on just haven't had those kind of formulas. Um, so it's always been a little more effort to try to pull off. For instance. You know, in Queen Sugar, we shoot a lot in, you know, kind of our sets, but we have these kind of uh, vista driven moments that are out in the farmland, which, you know, is a sacrifice for the production to figure out how to get every time. Mm-hmm. Um, also, with that particular show, because again, it's a little different than some other shows, um, we spend a lot of time on the visuals trying to make sure that we can capture the right feeling um, through the visuals. Um, uh, which means, you know, maybe we have to adjust our schedule because we can only shoot, you know, certain scenes at sunrise or, you know, trying to figure out where the sun's going to be at a certain given time to make sure that we can be there at that time. Um, in a feature, you know, that process is thought through way in advance. And typically, you know, in a feature, we go to a location once and that's it. Uh, where in TV, we may go every week. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's just that process of, grinding through it on TV can be a little relentless, especially, you know, nowadays TV's changed a lot. They used to have hiatuses and these breaks and everything. Um, now, if you're doing a, you know, 10 or 15 episode run, you know, you're looking at shooting, you know, 80 to 140, 150 days straight. Um, wow. And so that, can, you know, definitely wear on you and, you know, the TV cycle of uh, what we call Friday days, you know, usually you start, 6 a.m. on Monday, and by Friday you're coming in at you know 5 p.m. to work overnights, mm-hmm. um, and so it's a it's just a relentless kind of grind that works for some people. Some people have a hard time with it. Got it. Then you you're saying 150 days on on these series that have like 10 to 12 episodes a, per season. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's you know a lot of shows. It depends on how many episodes you have, but I mean how many days you shoot an episode, but you know. You know, shows typically shoot somewhere between seven days, and some of the bigger shows will shoot, you know, ten to twelve days an episode. Okay. Um, and and you don't really outside of you know certain holidays, like if you happen to shoot over Christmas, or you know, you don't really get any substantial breaks in the production process. It just shoots straight through. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you know, it, it is a you know when you look at it, especially like on a calendar, um, it can be a little daunting to look at the next four or five months of your life in, you know, kind of a daily basis where, you know, every day is accounted for. Mm. How do you choose a project? And, you know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, before I answer, I was going to finish and say the, the other big difference, I think, between the feature and the TV side is on the TV side, you're kind of always prepping, shooting and rapping at the same time. Mm. Um, you know, we're prepping for the next episode, shooting the current episode and wrapping the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so you kind of have to have this, you know, all three phases are happening where it features typically the prep shoot wrapper is its own individual phase for the whole show. Yeah. Um, on how to choose a production, a lot of times it's a mix of, um, what studios I'm working with, uh, the showrunner, um, or a director that I'm working with, um, you know, and then. The content, I think, is very important to just um, the more I can feel attached to it, it's, the easier it is to stay committed um, and give it the kind of concentration it takes to again last those long stretches of time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, partnering with a director or showrunner is so important um, because, again, like I said, if you can't find a happy medium to work together and you guys can't be kind of work as a unit as one, then it, it just makes it a a really miserable process. And then it just turns that other relationship, me and the studio into such a, uh, a tough one because then, you know, we have overages or we're not matching creatively what it is that the studio wants. Yeah. Um, they're not happy with the dailies or, you know, like things like that, where 
it just starts to show other systemic problems in the process. Mm -hmm. And do most um, wine producers have agents? Um, I, I would say, you know, most commercial ones that work, you know, um, do, do, um, it, it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times TV shows and movies, you know, are somewhat packaged, um, you know, so having an agent helps with that process because, you know, typically the agency is packaging the show for the writer, director, and actor. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't really consider packaging it with the line producer, but because they're doing all the rest of it, the agency knows the deal of the show way before anyone else does. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it gives you kind of an inside track on certain productions that, um, you just wouldn't have if you didn't have an agent involved by the time as a line producer, you heard about it, unless you had a relationship with the studio, which there are plenty uh, of producers that work a majority of time for one particular studio. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that can, you know, also kind of work around not having an agent, but I've typically found that it's, it's helpful. And, you know, um, if you, you know, if you have an agency that, um, is in the business of the shows that you like to work on, it helps too. If they, you know, if they're packaging those type of shows, if you like hour longs or, you know, if some producer wants to do half hour, single camera or half hour, multi camera, mm -hmm. um, the more productions that that agency packages, the more opportunities you have to be involved. Okay. Um, in regards to to low budget filmmaking, how does a director or executive producer find a line producer when they're on a when it's like a very low but ultra low budget, like fifty thousand dollar? budget for a feature sure. hundred thousand dollar like how do you sure. find a line producer um it's a it's a perilous process um you know uh, typically you know i would there's ways i would suggest i mean there's for me it's been mostly by relationships mm. um again um you know we all kind of typically kind of rise as a group so you know when i was doing it young um there were um, directors and producers that were, you know, kind of in that same ball game where, you know, a big line producer wasn't going to come and produce a, you know, hundred thousand dollar movie for somebody. You know, what I mean, it just didn't mm -hmm. make sense to me. Um, I was in that space, so it was like, you know, they would come to me because of, you just finished one. Um, but a lot of because a lot of that level of production ends up going into the festival markets. A lot of those contacts are made, I think, over that festival process right you go to sundance or telluride or toronto um and you're there with the production and people see that production and they want to know who made it and, you know like it's a small group of people yeah. um and so that word of mouth is really kind of the strong the strength of it um, um and then if you get really specific you know and you're dealing with women or people of color it's a really small circle um and so you know you'll you know, quickly get down to the two or three people who are in that space that you're working um, at the same time without much effort. Like, you, it doesn't take long to, to figure out who the two or three people are. Mm -hmm. um, I think the key is meeting them, talking to them, seeing if you guys have a vibe and have the same understanding of how to do things. Um, and if you do, it's great. You know, like for me, if, if I was going to pair with a, a director who, you know, could care less about, you know, working you know, kind of fly by wire and, you know, be a little more risky, that would be more difficult for me. Mm -hmm. uh, where there are other producers who would work like that. And they're like, yeah, I'm good with that. We should just do, we should shoot that scene driving up the freeway. Like it's mm -hmm. perfect, you know? Mm -hmm. um, um, but again, if the, if the two people aren't on the same page, then it, it's going to be a horrible relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but if both people are like, yeah, that sounds like a horrible idea. We need to come up with another way to do it. Those two people are meant to be together. Um, you don't want, you know, one who's like, yeah, we're going to do it this way. And the other person's like, well, I want to do it this way. Uh, Cause you'll do that through the whole shoot. And that, that um, conflict, I think uh, breeds bad energy in that creative process. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I, I truly believe that the better you can hone a creative process that, that fosters um, a good, a good experience for the actors, for the director, for everyone involved, the crew, um, it relates to the content that you're going to put out. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And the more contentious that process is, um, it's going to affect everyone's ability to operate on a level that's going to make that content, you know, really shine. Yeah. Yeah. You, you had mentioned, um, a small pool of, of line producers that are, are women or people of color. Um, right now, <clears throat> pardon me, right now there's a, a, a renaissance of, uh, black content creators, um, breaking through in Hollywood. And I'm curious to know if there are more black line producers that are breaking through as well. Do you, have you seen uh, you know, there are, over the years? I haven't seen it happening yet, but there are a ton of, of up and coming people in that kind of indie space that I think will have really um, amazing opportunities in, in the, in the next few years. Um, one of the, the things that I've seen happening is uh, since you do have a lot of these kind of driven younger minority or women in the creative uh, helm um, that the studios and networks are finding it necessary to partner them with, people who understand them in an in intrinsic, you know, like native level. Um, and sometimes you can't mix um, kind of what we talked about earlier, just, you know, on, on, you know, being on the same page creatively. Um, sometimes if you take someone from kind of that more traditional uh, Hollywood space and put them in with that kind of new, you know, young, um, you know, black female showrunner, it, it, that cultural divide sometimes could be a bit greater. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can cause a lot of drama um, behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. So I think the studios are even more interested in having a more diverse producing pool out there now um, to help match up with the with the look in front of the camera and even uh, in the writing side. Okay, yeah, that, that's awesome. It's great to hear. I hope that uh, more line producers break through that are people of color because... Um, you know, one of the reasons why we started Black Film Space is to be around each other when we're creating projects, you know, at least or at least have that option. Um, sure. So, uh, yeah, I, I was I was at a uh, I was at a panel once at ABFF and, mm-hmm. um, you know, somebody was asking, hey, you know, it was a studio a network diversity officer who was doing a panel, you know, it was one of many people on the panel. But, People in the audience ask, you know, hey, what what is what is your network doing to help, you know, in diversity behind the camera? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we're doing we have a diversity in acting program. We have a diversity in directing program. Um, and literally, you know, obviously the majority of people who uh, are going to any kind of festival or panel, though, everyone's like, well, I want to be a director or a writer. Um, the majority of people aren't going to make it as a director, right? Right? Yeah, They're going to fall yeah. back into another probably below the line position, um, and it really effectively isn't um, a diversity push behind the camera. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Below the line, everybody really focuses above the line and how amazing and great everything is above the line. But um, you know, I think we should equally be pushing and hoping for as much diversity below the line because. Um, you know, that same sensibility and, and diversity can um, contribute to a production just as much as it can above the line. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question, but I'm going to ask anyways, uh, okay. just because it's kind of general. But um, if you were on, if you were a line producer on a low, ultra low budget film, let's say $50,000. How would you allocate that money? I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's it, regardless if it's ultra low budget or if it's a, you know, $20 million feature, I think the, the philosophy is the same. You put the money where the priority is. Um, so if I'm doing a $50,000 feature, hopefully I'm, you know, also trying to match up my expectations to the right production, to the right budget. Uh, and I'm not trying to do a, you know, an action gun chase movie for $50,000. Um, but, you know, ideally, if if I am and I'm like, you know what, where I need to spend the money is on, um, you, know, I, you know, to be honest, it's like, what it, what is it I can't find? So if I can find a crew and equipment, then I'm going to spend my money on cast. Yeah. Um, if I can find a cast, I'm going to spend my money on crew and equipment. Um, but I'm going to prioritize to 
when you don't have money, everything else that you don't have money for still has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a question of how do you do it? And it might be in kind donations. It might be volunteers, whatever it is. Um, you're going to want to put that money in what it is you can't do. What equity can't you put in it via sweat? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I'm going to spend the money. So again, like I said, a lot of times, you know, when I was doing really low budget stuff, um, you know, we could make kind of a, a crazy flat deal for a DP who owned his own gear, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, some DP owned a, ca a red camera and some lights. So we're like, cool, you know, write him a check for 2,500 bucks. Um, and because this guy has, you know, he's a DP, he has some crew guys with him, you know, we're going to, you know, write them a small check, you know, 500 bucks or something each. Um, it is a, as an honorarium, um, you know, and we're going to go down to, you know, somebody's uncle and get some trucks so that we have somewhere to move the equipment around in and everybody's going to drive their own truck. Um, you know, I do need to, let's say, spend a little money on food because I'm not really paying anybody anything. So people can't really be out of pocket and, you know, you know, while they're working for me. So I got to take care of them. So, you know, let's say we're going to spend, you know, 10,000 of our 50 on food. Um, the other thing is, you know, I want to, you know, I need at least one name and it is, you know, I have this actor in my mind and I'm going to pay them five grand to come down and do it. You know, you just mm -hmm. literally piece it out in where you have to spend the money. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and prioritize it because at some point the money runs out and it's not a question of whether it has to be done or not. It literally comes down to, you know, do I have money or you know, do I have another option here? Uh, can I get a friend to do it? Can I get a friend's friend to do it? Uh, can we, you know, do without it? Is it something this time I have to do without, you know, mm -hmm. we, you know, we're going to shoot it like the Revenant. We don't have lights. We're going to shoot it in daylight, you know, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is that you can't come up with a solution around. That's what you put the money in. If you're a first time filmmaker or you're working on a low budget film, how do you book recognizable, a recognizable actor? I, you know, it's interesting. It, it's a, it's a, it's funny. Cause you know, one of the things that I always hear, uh, especially in like an indie space is somebody coming and saying, Hey man, you know, I got, you know, I don't want to say it's still a name. I got Denzel Washington. Uh, you know, Denzel Washington says he'd do this movie if I come up with the money. Um, I just always think that's hilarious because, um, the thought process behind that is that the studio couldn't get Denzel Washington to do a movie. And it was going to take your indie film to get Denzel Washington on screen. Mm -hmm. Like that's not the way it works. Like the studios hire actors every day. You having an actor or not is not what's going to make the studio do the film or not. Because if the studio wanted to do the film, they could just hire an actor. Mm -hmm. um, so I always find that, you know, the, the the default, like maybe I can get someone to, you know, say that they're going to join my production doesn't work. I feel like you got to go out and get people who are actually going to do it, regardless if you have the money or not. Yeah. Right. That actor is going to go and show up and eat Krispy Kremes for breakfast because that's all you have. Um, and if if you represent anything else or if you believe anything else, I think it's it's uh, folly because at the end of the day, you don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, so I feel like, you know, especially like in that festival world, it gets young filmmakers into a space where they can talk and meet other uh, you know, actors who especially are open to doing independent films because there are a ton of actors that are open to it. They know they're not going to make money. They know the conditions are not going to be what they're used to on a big feature. Uh, and they'd be down for it in a limited basis, right? If you say, hey, I, I just need for four days and I'll work around your schedule. Um, part of that is a lot of actors are looking for creative partners and directors, right? Especially up and coming actors that are looking to be leads maybe for the first time or looking to break out of a role, break out of being the good guy or the bad guy. Yeah. Um, they're looking for an opportunity. And um, you know, I always tell people that the key of it is, is that you have to be offering them something. It can't just be helping you, yeah, right? Yeah. It has to be some transaction happening on both sides. Like, I'm trying to get this movie made and this is a great role for you. Um, not just because I need it to be a great role for you to say yes, but legitimately, you know, trying to find people who have like write really compelling stuff, like write a great hero, write a great villain. And, it, you know, actors want to be inspired by the role. They're going to read it. Maybe they're going to say, wow, I got to be involved in this. Or they're going to say, you know what? You got to get. Yeah, I'll do it if you give me the money. Mm -hmm. um, and I always feel like if that's what they're feeding back to you, 
then either they really don't want to do it or you didn't write it in a way that, you know, brought them out of that space. Now, a lot of actors aren't going to do it. You know, they just, they got to make their money. If you're not, you know, a bona fide, you know, financial, uh, financially solvent, they're really not interested. Mm-hmm. But I would candor to say that a majority of, of working actors would do it for little or no money for the right project. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, being part of the Black Film Space podcast. Appreciate your time and, and your insight. Absolutely, man. Anytime. All right. Um, do you have like a social media or anything that people can, can follow you on? Uh, yeah. Um, um, I, I primarily, even though I do have Facebook, I'm on Instagram. Um, and it's just Paul Garns. All right. Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. Thanks and see you soon.